Last week, was, uh, I talked on the Jezebel spirit in Ahab, mm-hmm. and it was a fairly heavy topic, just, just to make you aware of, of, well, the dominance of that spirit in the body of Christ. Mm. So today I want to reverse, go the other way, and look at the power of God. Mm-hmm. And my message is, there's got to be more. Yeah. Because for too long, the church hasn't seen the real outpouring of God's power. That's right. And um, I know that we're coming in to the end of the age, and that means that the latter rain mm-hmm. is going to be mm-hmm. much greater That's than right. the early rain. Mm-hmm. That the power of God is going to be so much greater than mm-hmm. has ever been seen on this earth. Mm-hmm. And I have sought God diligently on behalf of you. I really have. I, I take this extremely serious, what I do. Mm-hmm. To, to seek God where he wants to take us each week. I don't just download a message. I'm not, I, I've got thousands of messages. I don't use old messages. I wait on the Lord. Mm-hmm. So I know this message is relevant to us. There's got to be more. And Lord, I just commit today to yeah. you, yeah. as by your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each of our hearts, our minds. You would challenge us where we need challenging. You'd rebuke us where we need rebuking. Mm. You'd encourage us where we need encouraging. Yeah. And Lord, thank you. You are working in each of our lives. Yes, and even at times we don't see it, Lord. Yes, your love is far greater yeah. Yeah. than anything we can do or say. And Lord, yeah. you are so concerned for each one of us. You're so in love with each one of us. Yeah. You have our interest in your hand, Lord. Yes, and we thank you for that. I give you all the glory and the praise for what you're going to do here today in Jesus' name. Open your Bibles if you have them to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. I said I, I thought I'd better start using a King James Bible. The NIV is getting me into trouble. <laughs> the nearly inspired version. <laughs> nearly inspired version. <laughs> And, uh, you know, one of the questions I have is, I'm, I'm sure if you're honest, you'll have too, is why do people go to church and leave the church the same way they go? Um, why do people come sick and leave sick? Why do we come with our problems and leave with our problems? And mm-hmm. I, I think this is the era of getting honest as Christians, mm-hmm. not being religious, just be honest and, and say, okay, it's working or it's not working. And so I just want to touch on this reality today, you know. We know the Bible says what we're to do, what we're to believe, and we preach it for those of us who preach or teach or worship lead. But in so many cases, it doesn't transpire to anything other than words. And, it, it, you know, sometimes for a preacher or a Bible teacher, it's difficult because you see the same people every week and you look at them and you think, are they ever going to change? <laughs> I know because I pass the churches and I used to bang my head against the wall sometimes just thinking, Lord, it's your word, but I'm not seeing any change. And You know what I'm talking about. You know? So this is a, to me, this is a big message. There's got to be more. And I carry a burden personally to see people have a personal encounter with God. The reason I carry the burden is because of what happened to me a year or so ago. You know, in that encounter with God, it changed my life totally. From a Christian with apathy, which by the way, Derek Prince says is the spirit across this nation, apathy. I was an apathetic Christian. Um, It doesn't mean to say I wasn't busy in the kingdom of God. I was. But I didn't carry a burden to see the power of God in people's lives and change lives. I, I, I treated it as a job. And I want to see people have that personal encounter that goes beyond salvation. That's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. That encounter with God that takes someone who's been saved and radically changes their life. Whether it be healing, whether it be a miracle they need, whether it be their family change, whether it be they change. And Jesus told his disciples, he said, wait here in Jerusalem. And he said that until the Holy Spirit's come upon you and you shall receive power. And we all know that. And I've often thought, and it came to me this morning, why did you say, wait, 
in Jerusalem mm-hmm. until you receive power. Because you've got to remember, Jesus was with these guys and girls for three years. He had plenty of power, and they were functioning in power. Mm-hmm. So I believe there's something significant here, and I believe what he was saying is up until now, I personally have endowed you with power, or clothed you with my power. Mm-hmm. But now it's time to change. You guys are on your own. You girls are on your own. Yeah. And I'm leaving here. Now you you need to get your own. You've got to get your own power. Yeah. And and you've got to get inspired yourself. Don't rely on me anymore. That's basically what Jesus was saying. Yeah. Yeah. See you later, alligator. I'm out of here. Yeah. You're on your own. Yeah. Fix it. You know, sort it out. Mm. And uh, don't rely on Peter or James or John. Mm. Just because they're the head of the church at the moment, don't look to them Mm. to get your healing or miracle or power or deliverance or whatever. You've got to get it yourself. And um, could it be that the power Jesus walked in was more than the experience we call the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm going to throw some stuff out here today that don't go sacrilege. At least listen to what I've got to say. Could it be the power Jesus walked in was more than the experience we call the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I know some of this is going to challenge your thinking, and that's the whole idea. I do this. I do it intentionally. Could it be that they already understood a power that we don't understand? Mm -hmm. That they had seen a power that we haven't seen? That they had functioned in a power that we haven't functioned in? Why? Because they're walking with the infinite God. They've walked with the God of the universe who became man but knew how to function in a realm that I believe most of us don't have any idea about. Mm -hmm. And if we walk with God or we walk with Jesus, I think we'd walk our lives a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It would shake us to our core. Mm -hmm. And if it was, does this mean we have to do something more than that we've already done? Or does it mean that we have to do more than going to the front and ask someone to pray for us for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Is there something more than this? And I believe Jesus was saying, this can only come from your own encounter. That's really what he was saying. Wait, Mm -hmm. have your own encounter with me. Mm -hmm. And it's called the secret place. That's what the Holy Spirit said to me today. I finished this message and he said, you've got to tell them it's called the secret place. Yes. This is where we have this encounter. The secret place. Mm. Why is it called a secret place? Because that's where God hides out. Mm. God hides out in the secret place. And it's a secret, even to Christians. (laughs) (laughs) To a lot of Christians, it's a secret where God hides out. Let's be honest. Mm. Because if we knew, there wouldn't be any sick in the church. (laughs) No, it's true. Come on, there's no sickness in heaven. That's right. Hmm? That's right. I'm not downing anyone. I know this is a sensitive topic. because I've been there myself. Have you noticed Jesus never gave a teaching on how to find the secret place? Mm. The 12 steps to the secret place. <laughs> no. But the modern church has got the 12 steps to counselling, the 12 steps to this, the 12 steps to deliverance, 12 <laughs> steps to getting rid of alcohol. But Jesus didn't give a 12 steps to the secret place. Yes. <laughs> Matter of fact, he didn't even tell us how to find it. That's right. And I believe the secrets of God, he doesn't tell us how to find them intentionally because they're secrets. Mm-hmm. You know, and when I was a kid, I remember growing up as a child, I love to play that game hide and seek. You know that game? Yeah? Yes. And in, in that game as a child, I still remember as a child, you're exploring. And as I was thinking about this, I truly was thinking of Daniel. I can just see Daniel's face looking for his mum or daddy when you're playing hide and seek, when you're hiding from. That's what I saw as I was praying about this. And as a child, I grew up and we used to go to Harcourt Park every year, annually, our church. And we'd have our annual celebrations and games and whatever there. And the children always had an activity called treasure hunt. Mm -hmm. And in that treasure hunt, the adults would hide little gifts, be a bar of chocolate or something. And they would give you a little map. Mm-hmm. And you'd have to find, as a little boy like Daniel, you, you get that map. And it wouldn't be so difficult, but it would be difficult enough that you'd have to study the map. And, Where's that big tree on that? And you'd look at it. 
hide and seek. And I know this shocks a lot of Christians because they think that God's just standing there pouring out everything. (laughs) But Jesus knew the heart of children. And he said, if you don't come to me as a little child, you can't receive. It's that simple. And we've complicated it so much. Mm. We complicate the truth so much. Mm. I thought of myself as a child playing that hide-and-seek game and how I used to diligently seek out whoever was hiding from me. I remember playing it with my little boy, Josh, as a little boy, and I could I could still hear it, Daddy, Daddy, where are you? Daddy, and I'd be hiding. I wouldn't make it too difficult, but difficult enough that he had to look. You know, because part of the pleasure of the parent is to see the child find you. That's the glory of the parent. Mm. And Jesus understood this in Matthew 18. And he says, unless you come as a little child. Mm. And we lose that simplicity after we get saved. Mm. That simplicity of all you need to do is to give me your life. And in return, I'll give you mine. And we start to complicate the gospel. And I understand a part of the body of Christ doesn't believe in healing. And I really want to major in on healing and miracles today because I believe in this end time move of God. This is going to be a key part of it. Healing and miracles. And I know there is a portion that doesn't believe and that doesn't concern me so much. Mm. It's the ones that do believe in healing and miracles and yet still can't get free that concern me. Mm. That's what concerns me. And I trust that I can answer some questions to this today. Or at least a part of it. As it doesn't come out of theory, it comes out of about 14 months of seeking the Lord myself. Until I found the answer. Until I found the answer. There is a simplistic answer to this. And I'm going to share it with you today. Proverbs 25 verse 2. Turn to it. This is one of the most wonderful scriptures in the Old Covenant. Proverbs 25 and verse 2. It is the glory Mm. of God to conceal a thing. Mm. That word conceal means to hide. But the honour of kings is to search it out. Oh, let that sink into your spirit today. It is the glory of God to hide a thing. But it is the honour of a king, that's you, to search out a matter. Mm. So what that actually is saying, if I can simplify it, this is my version, revised standard version from Martin is, God loves to hide things on you. Mm. It's that simple. It's the good news. God loves to hide things. <laughs> That's what it means. There's so much Jesus talked about this. Matthew yeah. 6, 33. Mm-hmm. Seek ye first. Seek. Hide and seek. Seek. Go looking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't just sit and wait. Go yeah. looking for it. Amen. Amen. God loves to hide things. And yeah. our job is His children. Yeah. It's to find it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going, come on, where are you? Yeah, yeah. Where are you, Val? I'm looking for you. Yeah, yeah. And you say, where are you, Lord? I'm looking for an answer for this. <laughs> Never give up seeking an answer. Yes. Just because it hasn't, you haven't seen it work or because someone's still sick, it doesn't mean we're to give up and accept it. Yes. Because we're struggling in life or whatever's going wrong in our life, we don't give up. And say the devil's too big. No, the devil isn't too big. Amen. Amen. Why does God hide things? I'm going to tell you why. Because he loves rewarding his children who diligently seek him. That's That's why. Oh, he loves to reward his children who diligently seek him. I guess in heaven, God designed that game a few million years ago. Hide and seek. (laughs) <laughs> we seem to think we designed it. Nah, come on. <laughs> God designed the game I didn't seek. And the father hides 
what he hides, there's always a purpose for it. There's a purpose why he hides things. He doesn't make it so difficult for us to find. And his pleasure is always found and when we seek it out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, even if we're seeking and we haven't found it, he'll just make it a little bit easier. Because he's saying, my child is looking. Mm -hmm. That's all he's wanting. But see, for too long, the church, I'm talking for the last 2,000 years, has looked to the clergy. Seek out the clergy. Mm -hmm. They'll give you a healing. They'll give you a miracle. They'll do this thing. God is saying, no, no, no. This is the hour. Mm -hmm. This is the hour He's going to impart His glory on individuals. Amen. Amen. The, the, the nobodies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the nobodies of life. This is the hour for the seek ye first with a passion. Think about it. What type of father would be so cruel to have his treasure and to make it impossible to find. Mm. <laughs> God's not like that. True. But the treasure of God's kingdom has a very high value on it. A very high value. And that's why he hides them. Mm. Because they have such a high value. Why? Because he paid such a high price mm. for it. When a ship sinks, and I thought of that movie, The Titanic, a ship that sunk with treasure on it. To be able to recover that treasure, it takes two things. Someone to find where the ship actually sunk. And secondly, a great investment to recover the treasure. Mm. And I guess that's a good parallel to the kingdom of God. The power available to the believer is the single greatest weapon given to us. So the question, I'm talking about God's powers, how do we access it? Mm. Have a look at Luke 4. I should have read this, I didn't, did I? Mm. Uh, Hallelujah. I know that in our prayer meetings, often it's come out, Lord, open our eyes. Mm-hmm. You remember the prophet in the old covenant? And it was just him and his servant. And the servant said, you don't seem to realize that we're surrounded with an army here. Mm-hmm. And the prophet said to him, Lord, open his eyes. You know, sometimes our problems seem so insurmountable. But greater is he that's with you and in you than he that's on the other side. And I'd be as bold to say today that God is going to open your eyes on something here. Remember these words of Jesus. Go back and tell John, who John the Baptist, he said this, the lame walk, the blind see, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the good news is preached everywhere. Amen. That's the message for this hour. Amen. Amen. That's the message for this hour. Amen. And today that's going to be fulfilled here. You watch. Luke 4, verse 32. Luke 4, verse 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. What does that say in another version? Does it use the word power? Authority. Okay. They were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. And, you know, the King James uses the word power, and some would say it's incorrect translation. It's actually not. The problem is in the English, we don't understand that the word power has more than one meaning. Yes. If you go down to verse 32, oh sorry, we just read that, and they were all astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And the other version is incorrect here, because the word power has two meanings. The word power means 
dynamic, dynamite, dunamis, dunamis, dunamis. explosive, miracle-working power. And then the other word is this word authority, which is the, I've forgotten the Greek, but it doesn't matter. For they were astonished at his teachings, for his word was with authority. Mm. Authority. And this word, I really want you to zero in on today. Because this is what the Lord's going to open your eyes to. Authority. Exousia is, is the word, the Greek word for authority. And what it means is this, judicial power. Authority given from the judge. Yeah. Yeah. Authority given from the judge, and we know who the judge is. There is only one judge. And this is the same in a court. This type of authority, it's like when you sit in a court and you hear the judge speak, and you say, man, that guy's got some authority. Why? Because he's got the laws of the land behind him. Yeah. Mm. Well, in God's kingdom... It's the same. This authority has the laws of God behind it. Amen. 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 And in verse 36, if you go down, it says, Then they were all amazed and spoke amongst themselves, saying, What a word is this for I, sorry, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirit and they come out. What, are, what does the other version say here? With authority and with power, verse 36. With authority and power. That's correct. Now notice within a space of just a few verses, it changes from just with authority mm. to with authority and, and power. power. Mm. So you've got these two words, dunamis, power, mm. and authority is this word, exousia, which is judicial power. So in the second verse we read, both of these powers are working together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want you to notice something. There actually is an order here mm. in this. The first power is an authoritative power. Mm. The power is coming from the judge. It's an authority that is coming from judgment. The second one is a miracle working power. And that's what we need when someone needs a miracle. And I'm not going to say a healing because actually, biblically, a healing is not a miracle. A miracle is a divine intervention of God. Yes, it is. Yes. It's a change in the natural to the supernatural. Mm -hmm. It's where God intervenes into the natural and changes it. It's when we see miracles like blind eyes open, mm -hmm. new eyes come into sockets and legs stretch out and whatever. That is... The dunamis power. And the church is very familiar with that word and probably understands it to some extent. But I believe this word authority is where we've lacked understanding. Yeah. And there is a divine order if there's going to be a miracle. Sometimes you need both forms of power for the miracle to happen. Amen. Amen. And my experience is most of the time you need both yeah. for a miracle to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Why? We're going to come to it soon. <laughs> Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. And then he gave them, who? His disciples, power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And verse 2. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Now, the writer is not illiterate. He understood what he was writing. It would seem that he's doubled up on information here, but he hasn't. Notice the two words, power and authority. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? Strong's concordance, power is the dunamis explosive. We've talked about that. This is a power that changes the physical course of nature. Miracle working power. Mm -hmm. you, you know... Daniel's probably seen it too on television, but when I grew up as a kid, we used to get the comics of Phantom and Superman <coughs> and all that. And, and in the comics, you see pow, kapow, and zap, and all this sort of stuff. And what it's actually saying, you remember that, Stuart? What it's saying is when that fist connects with your face, you're going to look like a sandwich. You see, that's what it's basically saying. When that power, that dunamis power connects, 
It does the damage it's meant to do and drives out the problem. It settles the problem. So you've got the picture. So on impact, something dynamic happens. Mm. Now, so to perform a miracle, you need, number one, an atmosphere of faith. Very important. That's why we, we have to have worship. Because if you don't have an atmosphere of faith, people's faith is not lifted yes. to a place yes. to receive it. That's the first key. The second is you need someone to speak a miracle into their life. Mm. Dunamis power. A divine intervention. Supernatural intervention in the physical course of nature. <coughs> or an intervention outside of natural means. So when someone is sick, we mostly say that person needs a miracle, mm. referring to this power, this dunamis power. Hmm? Just hang in there with me, because I'm going to open up something. So we pray for the sick, expecting God to intervene and cause a miracle. Correct? Okay? Let's be honest. That's yeah. what happens in most churches. We've all done it. Yeah. But I want to throw a curveball here. Just to upset your theology and say that's not correct in many cases. And I know you can quote me scriptures out of James, call for the elders and do this and do that. and that. You can quote as many verses as you like, but I'm still going to throw my curveball. Because there is a biblical order to miracles and healing. Yes, yes. And there's a vast difference. You see, just because we see a person sick doesn't mean that they need a miracle. Just because we see them sick doesn't mean they need a healing. Mm. Now you're really confused, correct? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now we're at a place that I can preach my message because, see, a person who is sick, the primary power that they need depends on the cause of the sickness. Mm. So when you pray for someone with dunamis power, you better make sure that they've got no demon causing that power. Because yeah. you're yeah. wasting your prayer. Mm. Dunamis power will not get rid of a demon. Can I prove it? Sure. I'll prove it out of the Bible. You're absolutely wasting your time praying for the demon oppressed or possessed. I'm talking Christians oppressed with demons. Yeah. You're wasting your time praying the prayer of faith to see them set free if they've got a demon in their life. And often, because it's a church setting, we thought, this person couldn't have a demon. That's the pastor's wife. or That's the pastor. He couldn't have a demon. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I've had them. Yeah. I don't know what makes you not exempt. <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. So I want you to notice Jesus' words in Luke 4, verse 32. He only uses the word authority mm. the first time. This will tell you something. When he was speaking, they were amazed. And if we don't, actually we should read that again. Luke 4, I want to read part of that chapter because you're going to see something here. There's a reason it's been written the way it is. Luke 4, verse 32. So in verse 32, he only uses this word authority. They're all astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Now, let's go down to the next verse. Carry on reading. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Leave us alone. What have we got to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? And I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him. See, this is why they were astonished. This is why they're astonished at his word. Because he rebuked and called the spirit out of this guy. That's the reason. It says in verse 32, they were astonished at his doctrine. Because he didn't go in and say, you're a poor person who's sick. Let me pray for a miracle. He cast the devil out of the person because he could. He Jesus could see 
into that person's life yeah. that the reason for whatever was happening in their yeah. life was caused because it was demonic. Yeah. Now, not every sickness is caused because of a demon, but I would have to say there's been a lot more that I've prayed for that are than that aren't. Mm. And this tells me something. We need the gift of discernment yeah. Yeah. so much as a believer. Mm-hmm. If there's a gift that you can pray for, pray for that. Mm. That God will give you the gift of discernment. See, there's a hidden treasure here. There is a hidden treasure in between verse 32 and verse 36. And it's that Jesus could discern the cause of the person's problem. And if you can't discern it, it's like being a boxer in a ring with a blindfold on. You're going to get smashed. (laughs) And you're going to be hitting into the air... Ineffectively, and sometimes it might work. <laughs> Your prayer might work, but most of the time it won't work. Mm. So notice the order: authority, and then power. Both words relate to power. Yet in this passage of scripture, there is a clear order: authority, and then power. And most of the time, we're trying to function in dunamis power rather than judicial authority. Praying for the sick when the sickness is caused by a demon will never be removed, ever. Mm. I know that in my own life. I got prayed for for 11 years by the best in the West, people all over the world, Mm -hmm. literally. Nobody could bring healing to my life. You say, no, but God does. No. We've got to understand God has entrusted his power to us. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we sit here and we wait for God to come out of heaven and bring a healing. God has entrusted his power to the saints. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop looking into the sky for the healing and start (laughs) understand that God has entrusted this great power and authority. Yes. Both to his saints. So much sickness that's caused in people's lives, goes undetected because it's demonic. And here's another hidden treasure. Because most believers are not walking in this level of authority Mm. that Jesus walked in. Mm. Nothing happens. See, as as a Christian, in order to see into the person's life, There's a level of authority you've got to get to. We can't just get saved and have that the next day. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, once you're saved, you know, you've got all the gifts and you've got, yeah, but you've got to come to a place where you can function in those. Yeah. Yeah. See, there's often a need to pray for a miracle after the demon has been cast out. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the demon will have caused Great damage in the person's body. Mm -hmm. For example, heart disease, cancer. Mm -hmm. They both destroy the inner parts of a person's body. I know, I've been on the receiving end of that. That's why you have to have multiple medications to keep you functioning. Mm -hmm. So even though the demon has been removed, the body is still very badly damaged. Mm. Now, that sickness cannot continue then if we pray that dunamis power into that person. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes that takes time for that healing process to happen. It might take a day. It might take a month. Mm. How quickly that person heals. And a lot of it has to do with practical stuff. Like, is that person eating properly? Mm. Mm. Are they getting sufficient rest? Those things are all important. Mm. And sometimes we get out on a limb spiritually and and, and we want the miracle now and everything has to be fixed now. And God's saying, hey, I told you, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You haven't looked after it. Deal with it. That's our part. God will do his part and we've got to do our part. So Jesus not only cast the demon out, he healed the physical damage that was caused. Mm. And two different events with two very different approaches. So when we're praying for the sick, 
We can't go in with this one-eyed approach. Let's just pray for the sick and hope they recover. No, we need to deliver them if they've got a demon and then pray for healing and then stand with them throughout that healing. We would usually associate this dunamis level of power with God, correct? And I, I guess that's a correct assumption because God is the giver of all power. But I'm going to shock someone here today. It's not only the Christians who have dunamis power. Satan also has dunamis power. Yeah, he does. You say, no, he's been stripped. No, he hasn't been stripped of any power. He was stripped of his authority. Yeah. <laughs> And you've got to read that word correctly. Some translations say stripped of his power. That actually means he was stripped of his authority, not stripped of his dunamis. Mm. There's a very big difference. The judicial authority is being number one in heaven, mm. was taken off him. He now no longer can speak into the lives of people as a judge. Mm. Now this changes the game totally for a Christian. Because the other day I heard someone talk about the devil and the devil was up here and the Christian was down here. And I'm thinking, dear God, you don't know. He's been stripped of his authority. He hasn't been stripped of his dunamis. Mm. And this is where we need to understand because Satan has power. Dunamis power, just like I have it, just like you have it. Mm. And if you want to get in a head-on battle with Satan, I'm going to tell you, you're going to lose. Dunamis power, he is going to destroy you. Because remember, he was number one in charge in heaven. Mm -hmm. So God entrusted great power to this being. Mm -hmm. And he also entrusted great judgment for this being. And when he took that judgment authority off Satan, and Satan fell, he fell with his power, his dunamis. So when we get cocky and we want to take on the devil... Dunamis wise, we're going to get smashed. We have to make sure that we're walking in our authority. Mm -hmm. Because this is the arena he can't walk in anymore. And this is why so many Christians are getting smashed. Because see, power is a gift. Mm -hmm. We're going to understand that power is a gift. And when a gift is given, it doesn't get taken back. Mm -hmm. I can prove that. You know the scripture. I'll read it to you after. The gifts of God and the callings are given, but they're not taken back. Mm. Have you ever wondered why some great miracle workers in this world who who draw massive crowds can still do miracles and be having affairs? That's why. Because the gift that's upon them is not taken back. God doesn't remove the gift. He didn't remove it from his angelic beings. A third of them are carrying this dunamis power. Now that shocks some theology, I know, but it's biblically sound. So the devil has this power. Look in Luke 10. I'm going to prove it to you, just so you can't throw a rock at me today. Luke 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you power, talking to his disciples, this is Jesus, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and over all the powers of the enemy, and over all the powers of the enemy. Mm-hmm. The, the enemy's got powers. <laughs> There's the evidence. So this tells us the enemy's got power. And the same power that you've got, except I would say in a far greater level. Don't go one-on-one, even with a demon. Even with a demon. You've got to go one-on-one in the authority. And even the angels of God understood this. When Michael stood before Lucifer and he said, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't even say, I rebuke you. And yet he had great authority. Mm -hmm. The Lord rebuke you. And now you can see why God gave this power to his children. This is the reason that he entrusted this dunamis power to us. Because he knew that we had no opportunity against these fallen beings if we didn't have it. So up until here, we've looked at this word dunamis But let me answer a question. Can a Christian perform miracles, healings, pastor churches, do crusades, 
open blind eyes, all that stuff, raise the dead and be living like the devil? And the answer is yes. And I know that shocks some people. But the only thing is with this is God won't strive with men forever. And sooner or later God will make sure that that person will pay the price. He will turn that person over to the devil. So in some cases we need dunamis power, but not in all cases. Mm. And I believe this word authority is the greatest weapon the church has. More than power. This word authority is the greatest weapon the church has. And when we enter into a confrontation with a demonic power, another force greater than dunamis is needed. And that is this authority mm. that Jesus has left for us. Now, this is where it gets tricky. Because although Jesus paid the price for this and has given it, we have to appropriate it. It's not automatic. Power, dunamis, is automatic. Maggie, you can go out today and heal the sick. Mm. It's a commission. It's been given to all of us. Luke can. Daniel can. It's a commission Jesus gave. It lay hands on the sick to recover. Mm. So it's, it's a gift he's given each one of us. But can we go out today and cast the devil out of someone? The church often would say yes, and I'd have to say no. Mm. You better make sure that you're standing in authority to do it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because the devil knows. That's right. The devil knows. Mm -hmm. And that's why even sometimes you see people go up the front and have deliverance, and they leave the same as they went. Because the one giving deliverance is not walking in that level of authority themselves. So the power that we understand mostly in the church is called the anointing. That's the word we use today. It's a modern word. and it, It's the dunamis power. That's what we're referring to. But Romans 11, 29 says, For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. Mm. Yeah. Meaning once God's given the gift, he doesn't take it back. Yeah. This applies to both God's children and his fallen angelic mm. beings. That probably scares some people. And when Satan has a legal case against us, we've got problems. What do I mean legal? This is the realm where Satan is a master at. And I'm not elevating him. But he knows what authority is. He knows what it is to work in the courts of heaven and the judicial system. He mm. understands the jury, the judge. He understands if he can get one of us into a place where he can accuse us because he is the accuser of the brethren. Mm. And he stands in the courts of heaven accusing us that they're in sin. You can't heal them. And God will have to say, prove it, tell me. And he'll say, such and such. And then God says, I have to take my hands off. I can't do this. See, for too long we've just thought that healing belongs to us at whatever cost. We can live like the devil and it's ours. No, that's not true. Mm. And someone says, well, how can Satan have a legal case if he's been stripped of his authority? And the answer is simple. He uses our authority against us. That's how. He uses our authority against us. In other words, he says, God, you strip me of my authority. <laughs> I'm going to strip them. Because you're a perfect, righteous judge. You're mm -hmm. holy. And you can't have one rule for me and a different rule for them. Yeah. You love me because you created me. And I was your master creation. And yet you took everything from me. So I'm going to take it from them. And that's how it works. So Satan has less than you and I have. 
to operate with. You have more power, I'm using both the words here, authority and power, than he does. And we need to understand that. And the, the whole key to this is whether we are walking in that authority, whether we're living in our authority or not. And I'm going to show you how to do that and how not to do it. You have dunamis power and can have authority if you give Satan no place. Now, what I, one thing I've found in the last year and a half, because of the amount of time I've spent, in God's word and his presence, and this is not to elevate me, please hear the spirit it's coming from. I have found that when I started this process, I knew there were things in my life needed dealing with. I knew that. Obvious stuff. But as I got further in, I didn't know there was anything. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there's anything. There is nothing that a person could walk into my life and point the finger and say, you got sin. Honestly. I was living in my, my eyes a holy, perfect life. But the more you press into him, the more you seek him, what happens? You get closer to him and his light or his glory radiates back on you. And it highlights what's wrong in you. The things you couldn't see before because of darkness. Now his presence, because you're in his presence so much, is shining on you and you can see what needs to change. So 18 months on, 18 months and I wasn't an axe murderer, okay? 18 months on, he is still revealing things to me. Still, to this day. And I've stripped a lot away. For those of you who know how I live, I live a... Yeah. But he's still. And the closer I get to him, the more authority I have, but the more his glory or light reflects on me and highlights what's wrong. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm not in any hurry to move beyond this house at the moment. <laughs> because I'm happy just being in his presence. Mm. I want to be like Peter. I want to be like Jesus was when they walked down the street mm. and his mere shadow fell upon people and held them. Where the demons cried out when you walked into a place. Mm. See, that's the authority that I'm talking about. That comes from being in his presence. There is no short circuit to this. You can't get this through step one, two, three or twelve steps to the presence of God or to his authority. It doesn't work like that. But this is going back to hide and seek. Mm -hmm. We have to come in simplicity and keep seeking and trying to find him. Mm -hmm. So Satan's got less than you've got. But he's done a good job of what he's got. We've mm -hmm. got to admit it. Yeah. He's deceived us. He's a master deceiver. So can the devil do miracles? Sure he can. Sure he can. There are many miracles and gifts operating that are of the devil. Shame on our police in this country and Australia. Shame on some of them for using these women with familiar spirits. Psychics mm -mm. trying to tap into the spiritual realm to give an answer for something that's happened that, that's illegal. And they're using illegal spirits to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. My God, we need to pray for our police. Mm -hmm. This is what Nebuchadnezzar used. Yeah. We need more Daniel standing up and saying, no more of this. Mm -hmm. No more. Mm -hmm. Fortune tellers, counterfeits of God's word of wisdom and these revelation gifts, the word of knowledge. And in the Philippines, I've seen many miracles happen. Many through doctors. They call themselves doctors, self-appointed quack doctors. More people use a quack doctor than they do a medical doctor because it's cheaper. You just give the quack doctor a chicken or a few eggs or whatever. Does it work? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is no different than the magician seemed in the day of Nebuchadnezzar or in the days of Moses. In Exodus 7, Moses gives a, an example of this where he engages in a battle with Pharaoh 
and he's got Aaron there, and Aaron throws down his his rod or his stick. Because Pharaoh is going to challenge Moses. In other words, evil is going to challenge good. Mm. And the magicians come in and they throw down their rods, and Aaron throws down his, but who wins? Aaron's. Why? Why? Authority. Authority. Mm. See, for a long time the church has believed it's because God just did this magical like wand and there we go. No, no, no. This is authority. This is authority that Moses got from God. Moses pulled it off because of authority. And it would be so easy to say God intervened and good won over evil and it sounds good. It sounds like a wonderful story. But I don't believe that for a minute. See, this type of thinking places all power back into the heavens. And that's not what God did. God placed power and authority mm-hmm. on his church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if we go back to Luke's account in chapter 4 and chapter 9, we see Jesus gave his disciples not only power, but he gave them also authority. Authority. Mm-hmm. Delegated mm-hmm. authority. There are three definitions of this in the Strong's Concordance. That was the first one. The second one is it prohibits the presence of any hindrance. Sound familiar? This authority prohibits the presence of any hindrance. Mm -hmm. Number three, judicial authority delegated from the highest courts in the world. That's the authority that he's given. You ever been amazed with authority? I've got to say, as a child, I wasn't that amazed until I went to Willesley College and the headmaster called me in one day and he said, take your pants off and bend over the table. And he pulled a cane off the wall (laughs) and gave me what they call six of the best. (laughs) The reason was is because I had taken some rocks and smashed a neighbor's windows because I thought she was a witch. And after that, I realized what authority was. <laughs> and I wasn't too keen on authority anymore. But this authority that these people saw was not that type of authority. This authority defied logic. You see? This authority defied reason. It defied reason. And this addressed the spiritual realm that previously man didn't understand or didn't partake in. See, when Jesus came... That, Casting out demons was a new thing. They, they hadn't seen this before. Yes. Where, where did this come from? Where did he get this? Mm. And Jesus had come on the scene with this dynamic, yet understood authority. And they didn't understand it. And I've got to say, I'm only just starting to understand it, so I don't know where you're at, but I think the church is probably much the same as it was back then. Not understanding authority. So how do we get it? Number one, authority comes from obedience. Number two, obedience comes from relationship. Mm -hmm. And number three, relationship takes time. There's no short circuit to that. Authority comes from obedience. Obedience comes from relationship. Relationship takes time. And unlike the power that is gifted to us, authority is appropriated only through obedience. Yeah. Only through obedience. Mm-hmm. There are levels of this authority that are received through the process of overcoming attacks of the enemy. How does authority increase in our life? You have to overcome the attacks of the enemy today. Mm-hmm. You have to overcome any sin in your life you know of today. Mm -hmm. You have to overcome those things that are troubling your relationship with your children. I don't mean you have to bring your children to Christ. You have to overcome the way you're handling it today before you can step up onto the next run of the ladder. And I guess when I was putting this together, that was a picture the Holy Spirit gave me, was a tall ladder reaching up into the sky. Mm -hmm. 
And as we overcome one problem, we stepped up one run on the ladder. Mm. And as each one we overcome, we stepped up another run. And as we got higher, what happened? We could see mm. something we couldn't see before. Yes. In other words, our eyes become more open. Mm. Do you ever wonder as someone who has discerning of spirits or who can see into the spirit realm, mm. this is why their eyes are open? Because they're quite a long way up the ladder already in the era of authority. And their view is a lot better as they get up. And that's how it works. So the higher you go up the ladder, and the more you conquer of the enemy's attacks through obedience, there is a downside also. The more visible you become to the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> And when you become more visible to the enemy, mm. the attacks are going to become more frequent. Yes, amen. <laughs> amen. And that's why most of the disciples and apostles paid with their lives. Mm. They become so visible. So if you're increasing suffering in your life or attacks, praise the Lord. <laughs> you're starting to become more visible to the enemy. And if you want to speed up the process of getting closer to the Lord in this authority, where demons will run when they see you or scream out like they did Jesus, if you want to fast track that, then the only quick way to do it is overcoming all the attacks of Satan through obedience. Mm -hmm. So the quicker we overcome, the quicker we walk into this realm of authority. Yeah. And it's a different realm. It has a different viewpoint, a different vantage point mm. where you start to look down on the enemy, not up. Whenever Jesus did a miracle, he did it with power. But whenever Jesus healed, it was done with authority. Mm. Exusia. Healing and deliverance usually work together. Hand in hand. And healing is the removal of something that requires authority, whereas miracles are the creation of something that requires power. Mm. That's the difference. And we could say biblical healing is what we would call today deliverance, I guess. I know, Sally, your dad functions in the arena. I've heard lots of stories where he was called in as the man that can see in the spirit realm. He walks in this arena. Miracles require God's power, mm. but healing require God's authority. God's authority is the highest form of legal endorsement that can be exercised on the earth, not power, authority. Authority is higher than power. Mm. Now this will start to open your eyes when you think of people that run all around the world trying to get healings or miracles. They're chasing this dunamis power. But what they should be chasing is the Lord, seeking Him first. Because yes. yeah. as you press into Him, the authority mm. starts to operate. Authority mm. is greater than power. Mm. Appropriating it always hinges on obedience. Obedience always hinges on relationship. The more time you spend in relationship, the more obedient you become as the Holy Spirit will reveal more mm. that you need to change. That's how it works. Until we obey today what he's told us, we don't walk in that obedience. You know, and I believed myself for many years prior that as long as I'm not doing sins that are obvious, I can't see any sin in my life, then there's nothing wrong. That's a deception. Because mm. I know when I sat up that night in my room in the presence of an angelic being, I felt like Isaiah. It's like your whole life has been undone when you're in the presence of God or his angels. Because they're creatures that carry light. Mm. 
That's what Lucifer was. Mm -hmm. And that light is so bright it radiates any darkness, even darkness we're not aware of. Sometimes we think by yelling at the demonic spirit, it gets rid of it. Maybe it's a bit deaf, but the truth is we don't need to yell at them. We just get a bit excited, I know, but we don't need to yell at them. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't make the spirit go any better. <laughs> it's not about the loudness. It's about how legitimate our authority is. Mm. Mm. And Jesus' presence was enough. He didn't even need to open his mouth. That's right. <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced that. I have once where I walked into someone's house and a woman was sitting on a couch and she sat up and her eyes just looked straight at me and she spoke to me with the deepest man's voice. She said, I'm going to kill you. And then she stood up and she said, would you like a cup of tea? Like nothing had happened. That's a demon speaking. <laughs> That's a demon speaking. Yeah. So discernment of spirits, we need it. Yeah. Huh? Yes. It's a gift you need to ask the Lord for. Ability to recognize, identify, distinguish various types of spirits, both good and evil. Mm. The Holy Spirit, angels, demons, and the human spirit. Without this gift operating in our lives, you know, as I said earlier, we're going to be like a boxer in a ring with a blindfold. It's going to be difficult. So covet that gift, pray for it. Huh? Mm. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers. We are spirit beings engaging with spirit beings. Mm -hmm. You are not a flesh. If you want evidence of that, go and get a knife and put it in your throat. You are a spirit being. Mm -hmm. And you are engaging with spirit beings. Mm -hmm. And we need to remind ourselves that every morning before we get up. I am a spirit. I am a spirit mm. engaging with other spirit beings both good and evil the first reason we need this gift of discernment is to lift the veil off our natural senses the second reason is to see as God sees you see with Samuel remember that story in 1 Samuel he said but the Lord does not look on the outward appearance See, we've tried to deal with problems by the outward. Mm. But God looks on the inward. The Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward, it says. But God looks on the heart. I heard someone say recently, that person's got a good heart. And I thought, you need the gift of discernment because just because someone's doing good works doesn't mean they've got a good heart. <laughs> Just because they're a pastor doesn't mean they've got a good heart. Mm. God looks at the heart and we'll all be judged by what our heart motive is. And the greatest thing I believe, I'm going to wrap this up, the greatest thing we can do as believers in the kingdom of God is not to do works in the kingdom, but to have an intimate relationship. Yeah. Yeah. If you had known me three, five years ago, I'm not the person I was then. I would have had three churches planted already. I would have done it in the flesh. God is not looking for what we can do mm -hmm. for Him. He's looking for us to have a relationship. Yeah. And out of that relationship, out of that relationship, He will then instruct us what to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not about we need to do this because this is the gift he's given us. I'm, and I'm not speaking to you, Yo, but many people think because they're a musician, they have to be a musician in the church. I would advise most musicians to not be musicians in the church if that's their gifting until they've literally submitted it to the Lord, mm -hmm. like Abraham did Isaac. It's not our gifts that God is looking for. Yeah. It's actually our weaknesses he's looking for. Mm. It's not those things that we're good at because that's how ego comes in. That's how pride comes in. Mm. And Satan's deceived so many Christians, including pastors, to get busy with kingdom business. 
And by doing this, especially pastors, we remove ourselves from his presence. Therefore, we remove ourselves from his authority. We lose our authority. Mm. The further we get away from being in his presence, the more time as a leader, as a pastor, as an evangelist, we get away from being in his presence to doing the works, the further away we get from the light. Mm. So the key is stay in his presence as long as you can. Do what you have to do. If it's preach, teach, whatever, then get back into that presence. Yeah. Yeah. The third reason is we need this gift of discernment to enable us to discern people's problems. The Apostle Paul operated frequently in this gift of discernment. When he spoke to the church at Galatia, I love this scripture, Galatians 3, 1, he said, Who has bewitched you? Mm. But he didn't stop there. He actually started it by saying, You fools. <laughs> Yeah. Imagine the preacher comes in and calls you a bunch of fools. Who has bewitched you, you fools? You started out good. You started in the spirit. That's what he says. Mm. Paul was clearly disappointed with this church. He didn't have a lot of good things <coughs> to say about it. And he calls them foolish because they thought they were wise. That's why he called them foolish. They actually thought they were wise. They were doing it right. But Paul had the gift of discernment and saw they weren't doing it right. Mm. And he points out what they were doing wrong. And he said they were bewitched, meaning they were deceived or fascinated. That's what the word means. Paul discerned deception. This church had fallen away because of this deception. They were still doing church. Every week they were going to church. This was a prosperous church. Paul said, who's deceived you? You started off in the spirit, and now you've got into your minds. That's what he's saying. Now you're trying to do church by reasoning. You have no discernment. You're doing things because you're gifted, but not because you're walking in the spirit. That's what Paul's saying to the Galatian church. Mm -hmm. You're so foolish you started out good. Legalism and carnality were the two things Paul points out about this church, that they've fallen away from the Spirit. Legalism, carnality. Where there's legalism, there's a religious spirit. Where there's a religious spirit, there's criticism. Mm. Mm. Criticism always goes with a religious spirit. Now, it doesn't mean to say you shouldn't criticize wrong and evil. We have to understand what this is talking about. But there was legalism in this church. There was carnality. And I believe this church had done what so many do today. And so many churches do today. They reverted back to humanism yeah. and psychology. Yeah. Preaching a feel-good message. Psychology is the answer. Twelve steps to your counseling problems. They were saved, but they'd gone back to their reasoning. They'd gone back into their heads. You see, psychology can tell you what's wrong with a person, but they can't fix it. Mm. Yes. <coughs> That's true. Mm. Psychiatry can't fix the problem. It can medicate it. That's all it can do. Mm. And in my years on the mission field, I saw many people who couldn't be controlled even by medicine, so what they would do and a brother and sister from the Philippines will know this is true, they'd chain people up outside. Put you either in a cage at the front of the property so you watch the cars going by all day, or chain you to a tree. And that's the way they deal with this mm. problem. And here in the West, you know, it's, it's as bad as that sounds, and it is bad, but here in the West I don't think we deal with it any better. Because the way we deal with it here is we use logic and reasoning and medication to deal with it. Mm. The person still doesn't get set free either way. Mm. So I wonder how far we've come from this church in Galatia. See, the problem today, I believe, in the church, is the church, the body of Christ, need to give back the headship to the head. Mm. Jesus is the head. The perfect head. The decisions 
that he made were perfect. They work. Mm. So as 2,000 years ago, there's no such thing as demons anymore. No su- oh, that's how foolish we've become yeah. like the church in Galatia. Yeah. We've believed that lie. We've believed that we can fix problems with, 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 with psychology or medicine for mental problems. That's how foolish we've become. The same back in the church of Galatia. And we think we've come so far, and that's what Paul was saying. You're so foolish. You think what you've done. You're educated. You think you've come a long way, but you've regressed. Mm. And you can go online and you can see this as many ministries, especially in Africa, Zambia, different places, where there is a constant string of people waiting to come in to get deliverance. Mm. Carried in. On beds, whatever. Sick people, demonized, whatever. And you can watch it online. You'll see one after another miracle happen. Just quit. Bang, 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 bang. People walking out totally free. Why? Why, why can someone come in who, who's absolutely crazy in their head and walk out totally normal? Why can someone come in who has no eyes and walk out with eyes a few minutes later? Mm-hmm. Why? Because these people don't have any money. They're mm-hmm. poor. And when you're poor, you can't buy your way out of your problems. The only way is you've got to go to the man of God and believe that that's going to work. So faith is generated already. And they walk in and they get free. Even the unbelievers get free. And that's the reason. That's the reason they have success. They believe God will free them. But the church at Galatia had given up on that notion and thought, no. We better come up with a plan how to free our people, how to heal them, how to set the captives free. And Jesus had already given the remedy. Mm. This is a question we need to remind ourselves. We all started out well. We all believed in the power of God. (coughs) We all believed in miracles and healing. So why is it we've come so far away? This is not a rebuke, this is a challenge Mm -hmm. to our minds. And this truth has to come back into the church of authority and power where people will stand with others and not give up until they're free. Mm -hmm. Not give up. Not allow the enemy who's already been stripped of his authority to have authority over that person's life. Not give up. And I got to thinking before I finished penciling this down today, man has tried to overcome man's problems with reasoning. And often that becomes witchcraft, Mm. control. And God's just saying, hey, come as a little child. That's all he's asking us. You know, you've tried the medicine for 16 years. Now come and touch my garment. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. This is the character of a loving father. Yeah, he's hidden some of this stuff from us. Mm. Because as I say, you need to get up the ladder a few runs so you can see what he sees. But this is what he's bringing the church back into in this hour. This is what you're going to see in this hour. For by one sacrifice Jesus has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Mm. Nothing more can be done. It is finished. Mm -hmm. It's finished. Satan knows that the cross was a total means of defeat. He knows it because it was. Mm. And we need to know it also. The cross is a total means of defeat to the enemy. And whatever's happening in our lives, it's not because the enemy is more powerful. It's not because the person is bad. It's because the enemy's got in and we need to find out how and shut it. Mm -hmm. We need to deal with this because we have been given authority. And if we can't deal with it, we need to call someone else in who can. Mm-hmm.
deliverance is coming back into the church in this hour. Oh, there's going to be a lot of it. It has to, to set the captives free. Because the children of God have been bound for too long. Mm-hmm. He's preparing us for a place where there is no sickness. Mm-hmm. There is no disease, there's no problems. But he's going to prepare that for us here on earth. Mm-hmm. Father, thank you, thank you. Yes, Lord. Mm-hmm. for your word. Mm-hmm. Lord, your word is truth. Yes, it is. Forgive us, Lord, for sometimes straying from that truth and Mm. and doubting you because we look at circumstances. We look to the ways of man to help us and to fix our problems when the truth is only you can set us free. Only you can truly heal us. Mm. Only you can Mm. truly deliver us. And we thank you, Lord, for, for modern medicine. And, and But, Lord, we know it's not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Mm. And we need your power mm. and authority more than ever in this hour mm. to defeat the works of the enemy, mm. to make an open display of those works, Lord, in front of people so they come to you. Yeah. Lord, this is the key that we need in this hour. Yes, Entrust us with this key. Yes, Entrust us, Lord, to, mm. to be bold mm. enough, mm. to not cow down, yes, but to stand up and declare righteousness, holiness and truth. Yes. Amen. And even when our loved ones, our friends, Lord, would turn against us for standing up for truth, mm. help us to remain bold. Yeah. Yes. Mm. They come against the works of Satan that would try and interfere with our minds and our lives. Discouragement. Those strongholds, those those reasonings that have kept us captive in the name of Jesus, I break the power of them this day. Let the light of your glorious gospel penetrate in each one of our lives. Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord, that our relationship with you would become so intimate we wouldn't want to leave that yeah. place of intimacy. Yeah. Yeah. This is our desire. Yes, it is. Yeah. To honor you. Yeah. Yeah. To love you. Yeah. To adore you. Yeah. To be in your presence, to play hide and seek and to find you. Yeah. Yeah. We give you all the honor you deserve this day, which, Lord, we haven't got much to give except ourselves. Mm-hmm. Use us. Use us. Mm-hmm. Use us. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.